All right. Well, welcome everyone. We will get started. Um, we want to. Uh, we have a lot actually to talk about and some really exciting stuff tonight. So I'm really glad that you can join us. Um, so thank you for. Um, just understanding we had some technical stuff last time, um, but um, we want to fit it all in just recognizing that we all have, um, you know, really busy ends of the year, kind of that May, June coming up. So, um, so I'm going to start, this is our agenda. So I'm going to start by just taking us back to those, uh, those chapters we were going to talk about last time and thinking about, I wanted to hone in on um, examining and, and just thinking more critically about how we structure our literacy blocks. Um, I wanted to touch on independent reading. And then Chad's going to come in and talk about that end of the book where Christopher Setch talks about just putting it all together. Um, we'll have some, some time for breakout rooms. And then I do have a guest speaker tonight, Stacey Moser from Holy Trinity is going to talk about uh, her work alongside some classroom teachers in implementing um, an oral reading fluency assessment. Uh, so that is going to be really exciting. If you're new to that, you will definitely want to hear about her uh, like truly lived experience around that. So I want us to just think about that structure of your literacy block. So if you are a classroom teacher, you know what that looks like. And when I say literacy block, I'm really thinking about that sustained amount of time um, that you have in your day to really focus on literacy. So uh, it might be, I, I usually kind of say 100 minutes in Saskatchewan. I think we have about 112 minutes that we can play with in, uh, for sure in grades one to three, um, 112 minutes per day, which would fill in our time for the week. Um, but that may look different if you're in Ontario or another province, I'm not sure what your minutes are for literacy in your curriculum. Um, so I want us to just think about that instruction. And I want us to think about um, what does your instruction look like for word reading and decoding skills? So what do you do for that? Maybe you use some sort of uh, resource. Um, you know, I, I, you know how, how does that look? What does your instruction look like where you're actually really supporting that knowledge building with students? What about vocabulary? Where does that live and how does that live in your literacy? What about fluency? So when we think about fluency in the different grade levels, if we're thinking kind of that pre-K to grade three, do you have some, some really intentional time where you're building that letter name and sound fluency um, to automaticity? What about that word level or um, working, moving into that prosody and intonation um, where you're looking at punctuation specifically with students and thinking about how does um, punctuation uh, influence my intonation when I'm when I'm reading because we want kids to have that not only when they read aloud but also when they're reading silently um, I mean and obviously we can't hear that but we want to know that they're doing that because that's really going to influence meaning what about syntax so so you know are you does that live in your literacy block teaching that explicit syntax what about text knowledge? So those print conventions, how to approach different types of texts. What do headings mean? Um, I don't know how many of you experience this, but I've read enough nonfiction texts with students and I find that they don't read the heading. They actually skip over the heading and move right into the content. And I'm like, you, you need to read the heading. I mean, that's really important. It's going to set your, your learning up, your mind up for what that next section is going to be about. So do they know how important reading that is? Do they know how important reading reading um, the, the labels and things like that on diagrams, if that's in text. Um, what about different genres? Do they, do they know that when they approach a book that is maybe a fantasy, what kind of story structure might that imply? Or, or what are they almost prepared for when they read compared to, uh, you know, more of a realistic fiction? And then, of course, we can't forget about writing. And when we think about writing, 
we have to think about those foundational skills, those transcription skills like printing, cursive, um, spelling, and then moving into that composition and, and how do we fit all of that in? So is this time in your day, is that a sustained period of time? Um, and if so, how do you fit all of those pieces? And I don't even think, you know, I haven't listed everything there. So how do you fit that all in? Or are you, you know, really intentionally, you have a sustained block of time where maybe you say, okay, in my sustained block of time, we are focusing on really explicit phonics lesson that includes phonemic awareness. Um, I do more of my building knowledge and vocabulary in my science or social studies time um, through that content area to develop some, some really um, important background knowledge on those specific topics and concepts that we're working through in, in that area. Um, so, you know, what, what might that look like in those other content areas? So tonight, I'm not going to unpack all of these components. Of course, we don't have enough time. But what I want us to do is just consider a very common structure for literacy blocks. Uh, and we know what this is, right? Um, now, some of you may be doing this and and doing daily five. Um, this is a structure that I did as a classroom teacher. Um, and if you are an administrator, you know, maybe you're, you're going through your walkthroughs and you see daily five. And I want us to really think about that. And when I started my learning around this, there were some, some kind of key things that I started reading and I thought, oh, wow, actually, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's just take a look at something that Tim Shanahan says. When he talks about daily five, he said it actually focuses on teaching the activity rather than on learning outcomes. So when we are creating that daily five structure or routine, right, um, we're focusing on the activity. And so he does say, and exactly, so the, the management time or that system or that routine, routines are really, really important, but we need to consider what lives in those routines and those structures. So he also says that reading to someone, someone and listening to someone read are fine, of course, um, but where is that teacher push in? And if it's not happening, then are we really getting students where we need them to be? So he said that it establishes a low standard for teaching because it emphasizes those activities or outcomes. When I think back on when I did it in my grade one and my one two classroom, I mean, I was I was really trying to implement that with fidelity and looking through the book and you know, we, we worked, we started on day one about building that stamina and we worked on, um, you know, you know, what does it look like? What does it not look like? And, you know, when I think back on all the time that we spent really just kind of practicing that, you know, sit, look at the book and when I'm going to time you. And as soon as somebody looks up, we're going to stop the time and bring you back and, and talk about this. You know, I could have actually been doing some really explicit teaching during that time. Um, so it's just something to think about. Yes, so routines, really important, but we need to consider, um, I think that the biggest thing is considering at this age, the amount of teacher time that the students have with you. So let's take a peek. So while we, while we think about daily five, what I want you to think about is how much those time kids are, are spending building that stamina versus actually practicing skills. How much of the time are they doing an independent or partner activity versus teacher time? And when they're doing those partner activities or the independent activities, who's providing that immediate corrective feedback that's really necessary for learning? So I think that if students are working independently, it needs to be something that they can do with a really high degree of accuracy. And so if that's all they're practicing, like we need to kind of put them on the verge of hard. They need that, you know, to take them to the next step. So when is that happening? And I also want us to think about the strands of the reading rope and think about, 
you know, when are they developing those language strands? So if the majority of your literacy block is spent doing daily five, which really works on more of the, I mean, it's a stretch, I think, but it would work more on the word recognition, you know, uh, work on um, words. So maybe the kids are just are, are writing words off the, the word wall or whatever that might look like. Um, they're doing read to self, read to someone. Um, and, you know, you could you could say that maybe they're they're learning some vocabulary in that time, but it's not explicit. Um, so we need to think about when are they building those language strands. So what can we do instead? I mean, of course, instead, what we can think about is a structured literacy approach. So an approach to instruction where that is very explicit. So these are young students who are learning these skills um, for the first time, and they're developing these skills. So that instruction really needs to be explicit. It needs to be systematic, sequential. So we're building you know, from easier to more complex, building in that cumulative review so that students have opportunities for that review um, and for practice, and it needs to be diagnostic. So we, we, of course, need to know what skills students have and which they don't. And then while we're teaching, are they learning the skills? And if not, then we need to continue to, to reteach. So here's another quote, and it says that students who spend large portions of time in independent or center-based work may not receive the desired level of teacher-directed instruction and impacts their level of engaged learning. So let's kind of take a minute just to kind of compare. So if you have a daily five block in your, you know, that that's the structure, the routine that you have. And this is, again, this is what I did. So um, I think mine was probably about 100 minutes. I think I used two 50-minute blocks. That's how our, our um, time was laid out. Um, so you have your teacher, your small group. So there's your teacher time. But then you also have these, these different activities. So word work, listening to reading, read to self, read to someone, and then work on writing. So if we think about that split into 100 minutes, you know, those kids in that 100 minute block might get maybe 20 minutes and it depends. I know that everybody kind of does this differently. Um, you know, you might have longer times with a specific group, but the kids rotate differently. Um, but then you're not seeing each small group every single day. There's lots of different ways, but essentially the majority of the time is spent independent of the teacher. And a very small amount of time is actually spent where the students are getting that instruction and that feedback that's really important. We don't want them to practice things incorrectly, right? We want that opportunity to correct those, those you know, mistakes and, and provide that feedback immediately. Versus something like a structured literacy block where here you might have a 100 minute um, kind of literacy block where you're gonna start with some quick phonemic awareness activities, move into a nice uh, phonics and spelling, um, you know, block of instruction, maybe about 20, 25 minutes, and then you're giving them opportunities to practice. So now they're practicing those skills I've just taught them in my phonics lesson. And here's where I can pull a small group, but my other students are working on what we've just learned. And then I'm going to build in my read aloud where now I'm bringing in the, the great picture books where I'm explicitly teaching some vocabulary and we're building on some knowledge and I might do some discursive strategies. Um, and then I can have some writing connected to that read aloud um, or a mini lesson in writing. So when you look at that, if that's a 100 minute block, you have a very small percentage of time where you have, uh, you know, that small group instruction but it's very targeted and a lot of time where kids are actively involved um, and are getting uh, that explicit instruction that they need. So it's just something to consider and think about and, and maybe, you know, be something that you, you consider shifting. Um, if you currently use a, a daily five approach, um, again, that would work for many students, but it's not going to work for the students that need um, that really explicit direct instruction. Here is a great um, 
resource. If you, if you have never seen this or read it, um, it's, it's really nicely laid out. Uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat. Nope, not right now. I will do that later. Um, but we'll send you these slides and the, that is a live link. Um, so this is a great uh, little article that if you are using a balanced literacy approach, or maybe you're in a school or a division that continues to, and you're trying to, to weave in more of a, an approach that is more aligned with the science of reading, um, this is something that could be shared. And, and it just kind of positions you in like, I kind of do this, but if I'm doing this, maybe instead I can make this change that uh, is, is more aligned with the science of reading. So I'll make sure to put that in the chat for you guys. I would be remiss if I did not add these two webinars in here. Um, again, these are going to be live linked for you, but I'll put them in the chat again. Um, the maximizing the benefits of small group instruction was exceptional. So if you're thinking, I really, I mean, I still really need small group instruction. Absolutely, you do. Um, Jamie really does this nicely. She talks about how um, she runs that, does that whole group instruction? And then what does that small group instruction look like? And I mean, she talks about using your data to create your group and to use your data to think about what do all of my kids need? What am I teaching for my whole group instruction? And then how am I targeting that small group instruction for students? So a really great webinar, you must check it out. And um, Another one is that structured literacy in kindergarten, and you do not have to be a kindergarten teacher to watch that. Any grade level could watch that. It is another exceptional um, webinar. I also wanted to just highlight because there's so many, there's so many, um, there's so much misinformation that comes out that is really trying to suggest, I mean, I think we probably all heard it, the science of reading only focuses on phonics, which is absolutely not true. Um, and this is, this is a recent one I saw on Twitter about the science of reading almost like rejects the use of picture books. Um, and what's unfortunate is that I think this Nancy Bailey is, uh, is a PhD. And so when we see that, we believe it, right? We believe that somebody who has those initials after their name really knows what they're talking about and, and, you know, should be somebody that we trust. But that idea that the science of reading rejects picture books is absolutely misinformation. Um, and the thing is, is that classroom teachers whose teaching is informed by the science of reading know that picture books are an absolute important and essential part of their instruction and of their day. Um, so, you know, of course, we use them to teach vocabulary. Um, if you haven't really looked at the picture books that you're reading out loud to students for the types of vocabulary that's in there, do it because you will actually be surprised I teach um, undergrads at the university, and that's one activity I do every year with them is I give them a whole bunch of picture books and I say, pull out some of that sophisticated, rich, robust vocabulary. And the lists that they come up with are just long. And that's in a picture book that we would read to a grade one student. Um, so they are full of really rich, um, exciting words that we wanna teach students. So we can use them to teach vocabulary to develop all of those language skills that we saw at the top of the rope. We want to use them as models for writing. We want to use them to develop background knowledge. We can use them as men for text and then pull words and, and you know, or even use rhyming books or, or books that are alliterative to teach those phonemic awareness skills. Um, we use them to teach figurative language. Um, and of course we read them to entertain kids and, and because they're just fun, they're fun to read. So they are an essential part of the development of those language strands. Um, but the, the key difference is that we are reading them out loud to the children because they haven't developed the word recognition skills to read them on their own. So I'm not going to put that in front of a student and say, here, read it and gain all this rich knowledge that I could actually approach it and teach it um, to them. So that's a key difference. So we had created this graphic where we looked at the uh, types of texts that we would want to use and which skills we want to develop. So when those early readers, with our early readers, 
the books that they should be practicing with are those decodable texts but we can use level text and early chapter books and picture books to read out loud to develop those language skills. And then when students are ready and they've developed those skills to, to you know, a level of proficiency, they can start using those books um, and approaching them, you know, to read on their own. And we're also not saying they can never, ever look at them, right? So when are they looking at them? So in my literacy block, and when I'm having them apply what I've taught them in my literacy block, I want them in those decodable texts that are aligned with the skills that I've taught them so that they can practice. But there might be a soft landing time or that, you know, they finish their math early and they want to take a look at a book where they want to pull that um, book that you read out loud to them because they loved it and look through it. Or they might want to pull that Guinness Book of World Records book and, and kind of go through it. So absolutely, there's a time and a place um, that lives within the day. But during that time when I actually want them to practice those skills, then I really want to be intentional in the books that they are engaging with or materials, right? It could be a poem, it could be a passage, um, whatever that looks like. I'm also going to share these resources. Um, I know I mentioned syntax early on. If you are not familiar with the syntax project, it is, um, it's really a, an amazing resource um, split out by grade level. I think it was developed in Australia. Uh, but if you maybe aren't strong, um, you don't have a strength in, in teaching kind of that grammatical structure of language, um, this is done really nicely in that uh, I do, we do, you do. Uh, routine built in, and it's all pre-built for you in PowerPoint or Google Slides, I think. Um, I want to link you to IDA Ontario because they have a hub of resources that are exceptional, including French immersion resources for those of you who teach French immersion, or maybe you're in a, a dual stream school. Um, you could share that with uh, some of your colleagues because uh, that's often something I hear in Saskatoon is, okay, we have a lot of resources for the English, but what about our French immersion uh, uh, teachers and classrooms? And, and they've really, uh, you know, pulled together a lot of great resources. And then there's a great article by Jan Hasbrook that just talks about um, that silent reading time, the independent reading time, and, you know, makes us think a little bit more critically about that as well. I think that's something that we, we are used to doing is, okay, we have our drop everything and read time and, you know, who's reading? So it's something to think about, right? Who's actually reading during that time? So that's my section. I'm going to pass it off to Chad, and then I will pop some of these, um, links in your chat. All right. I think we can see it here. Yeah, it looks great, Chad. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> All right, so this one here is is kind of going near the uh, end of the book there and as as Christopher talks about kind of um, you know, putting it all together or you know, looking at how do you how do you find a balance with all these things? And so some of the stuff that Andrea talked about already, you'll kind of see uh, in some of these things how I kind of talk about how we might put this all together and what it might look like uh, in a grade, um, you know, two, two, three class um, with that. And so again, here, I'll just put the slide in if there's things to connect or whatever it might be um, for it. But I want to take the next uh, you know, 15 minutes here or so just to kind of talk about it. And when I say putting it all together, I kind of frame it around kind of the five pillars. And I know writing instruction is in there as well um, for it kind of as the six. So um, we'll kind of see where does this all fit in? What are some of the activities that we're doing? Um, looking at that, looking at that from a, a structured uh, literacy approach there in kind of weaving things all together into the day. And I'll kind of talk about uh, how I how I do that uh, as a classroom teacher. And so the first one here, the, the big umbrella of uh, the phonological awareness there, 
obviously lots of things underneath there. And so, you know, one, and, and Andrea mentioned too, is, is understanding like, where are they at? And so what are the things that we need to do? And so oftentimes you'll see people might use the past uh, or people might use um, Haggerty for kind of seeing where their students are at. And so for us in, in our school, um, what we've decided is uh, consistently from, from K to, to four is, is using the, the Haggerty. And so right away off the bat, you know, trying to figure out where, where our students are at using that. And so one of the things, if you are familiar with Haggerty, um, one of the things that I kind of did is with Haggerty's um, six pager, uh, I've kind of made it into a one pager. Um, and so again, instead of flipping through it, doing all those types of things, um, this is one where you can just do it all on one page and get a quick little glimpse here um, for your students as you do it. So again, it matches up nicely with Haggerty's, uh, but again, I've just put it in all on one page um, for that. And then, you know, as we're thinking about it and going, okay, what do I need to do? How do I need to explicitly teach this? Where are my students at? Where is the class at? I put all this, you know, into um, an Excel here where obviously it matches up with Haggerty stuff. And I can see right away, you know, what are, what are some of the things that, that I'm seeing from students? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of isolating final sounds and words where, where that's kind of the majority might be a bit lower of these students. Obviously, there's more as we go. You know, opportunities to put notes in um, from those things. And so really, this is going to kind of guide me in where some of the explicit instruction is in this area um, with the class. And so as we might do that, there might be some activities that we do. And so here are some that I, I, I don't necessarily do in the, in the grade two, uh, but I've done where I work in, in a kindergarten class or a grade one class. And, and again, under that phonological awareness umbrella, looking at kind of those words and words and sentences and, and understanding that print and print concept. And so here's a little activity that we would do. Um, you know, I would, I would model it and then we would do it together. And then obviously if there's students um, that might need it um, individually or small group, we can do that. And so this is kind of words and sentences, a little magnet, the words activity here. How many words in the sentence, the black cat, the black cat, three. All right, how many words in this sentence? The big brown bear, the big brown bear, four. And so again, an activity that we do as, as a whole class where we're starting to look at that. Again, as you know, when you're working with younger readers, you, you, you say a long word, hippopotamus, um, they, they might think that that's more than one word. And so again, just getting that idea of there's words and sentences, what do words mean, understanding that these words have meanings and, and, and looking at that with um, you know, print concepts as you go. The other thing too, looking at that is, is syllables and understanding that that consonants and vowels, those are phonemes and, and not letters. And so understanding that, you know, which, which ones do have a stop in the sound, um, you know, which ones don't and, and do students understand that, you know, as they continue to, to learn to, to read and write, um, which be helpful. And so again, there's some different activities that uh, you can look at uh, as you go um, for that. Under that onset and rhyme, putting it all together, you know, again, an activity where we might have it is I, I pull out the felt and, you know, we do some activities with this. And so I'll just show you um, some of the things that we do. Again, this is one where I have that. I have them on magnets. It goes on the board so that so that kids can see it again, explicitly modeled it. Then they can do it. Uh, and then again, we might do it uh, on our own in small, small groups or, or in partners. And so this is how it, it might go. If you were to do the word cat, it might be k at put them together, cat. If you're looking at it and doing cup, it might be k up, put them together, cup. Now using the felt here, it might be that now this, this medium sized one is a bigger onset. So in the word blast, it might be bl -ast blast. And so it just helps kids with the size of the felt with in terms of the length of the onset and the rhyme. And so again, another activity just to, to, to break up some, some of the, the words into the onset and rhyme. But again, having those for those students who need, um, you know, that, that felt that might be different pieces um, that they can do. 
um, for it. And again, it's not, it's not for all students. Again, some can break it up into the onset rhyme and might not need that, but that's just one where, where some people who do, um, you have that and it's a visual reminder there for students as you either break it apart or put the words back together through the onset and rhyme. And we know that there's, you know, again, those rhyme and alliteration activities that we can do out throughout the day, the oddity task, which one doesn't rhyme, you know, those often show up in some of the small phonemic awareness activities that we do at the start of the day, adding in those tongue twisters and poems and songs to really make sure like, you know, understanding um, rhyme. But um, again, remembering that there's, there's the two types of rhyme, right? The, the R, R H Y M E um, and the R I M E. And so do, do students understand um, some of those where it's, you know, those word families or those ones that rhyme but might be spelt a little bit differently. And so again, add it in in today, um, you know, whether it's that mentor text that you're bringing in that, that's talking about some of those rhymes or the nursery rhymes, all those types of things that you're going to bring in, um, you know, as a teacher, those rich mentor texts that you can dissect, um, you know, as you explicitly talk about rhyme um, with our students. And then can they, can they then start to you know, with fluency practice, start to read some of the rhymes. Are they looking for rhymes? Uh, again, are they doing some of these little activities so that they can distinguish does it rhyme or not um, as they improve their, their um, phonological awareness uh, as they begin to read? And so the second pillar here, um, looking at it with, with phonics. And so how do we kind of explicitly, um, you know, teach or go through phonics? And, and then how do we you know, how does that translate into the whole class and, and what are students doing? And so we know that, you know, phonics is that relationship between those phonemes and graphemes. And I really like the bottom one there, like, you know, to understand about decoding is, is how they spell words. And so one of the things that, um, again, I typically do before I start the year or I start a small group is where are they at? And so what kind of inventory? And so I kind of use the, the word their way spelling inventory. And I, I look at this and, and I see um, where the students are at. And then I can start to make some groups or I can make some targeted instruction whole class if there's some things that are particularly standing out for the majority uh, of the students. The other thing that I do with that you know, with the phonics is, is again, a, a decoding inventory. And, and I use the one from, you know, from Walpole uh, with the how to plan differentiated reading instruction. And so again, I, I get them to, to, to say the words, there's uh, no nonsense words, and there's, and there's real words pertaining to um, the different categories there. And so that really tells me where some of my students are at. And I was really um, surprised with some of the, the strong readers um, that I had had difficulty with the decoding. And so they were they were um, further back than I had thought based on how well they were reading some of the books. And so again, you know, sometimes that can um, catch us by surprise a bit as teachers to see, you know, that a student's reading well, but again, that decoding is some of the areas that they're struggling with. And then so from this, I can create either, um, you know, small group or targeted instruction as we talk about uh, some of these things. And so whatever we might be doing as we go through the phonics explicit instruction, talking about short vowels first, and as we continue on, there's going to be some of these activities that we're going to do with it. But again, this just helps me to meet the kids where they're at um, so I know where to go. And so again, I continue to tabulate it there on an Excel spreadsheet just for me to see um, how they're doing um, with this. And so along with that, we know that, you know, there are definitely high frequency words or, or heart words that, that need to be. And so, you know, from looking at this on the left side, these are pre-primer um, words, but yet really out of the pre-primer words, there's, there's only seven that need to be, um, you know, heart words. The others could be decoded if, if, if they understand, um, the, you know, the phonemes of grafting relationship. And so with these uh, heart words, then again, explicitly taught, Explicitly going through it, utilizing it in activity, utilizing it in, in dictation and in sentences um, for them to, to make that connection from, okay, how do we say it? Or what's making the different sound in it that's not supposed to? And then again, how do we write it? And then how can we integrate it into our writing um, for that? And so that, that heart word um, bulletin board stays up. And since then, I've added the primer and the grade one, and the grade two, and and, and we're going through the grade three ones right now. And so those stay up there um, for reference for kids um, as they go with some of the hard word stuff. 
And again, we all know there's there's lots of different ways to introduce uh, you know the phonics and, and how you integrate it. I explicitly teach it by telling a, a story, and we know that some sometimes teachers use the the secret stories. And so it's just a, a fun little way for kids to be introduced to the sound through a story. And then there's that visual up on the wall that then students can connect with um, as they're looking at it. So if they're trying to sound something out when they're writing, they might look to it and go, okay, what's that story that connects with that sound? Ah, here it is. And then I, I know what, um, what sound it might be. Again, there's gonna be some explicit teaching throughout it. Like when is it, when do we use ER versus IR? Or when do we use the OI versus OY? Those types of things are gonna be explicit um, and then provide that practice um, in our class. And so we might do the explicit phonics instruction, but then we're gonna do some activities with it. Do they then draw the picture themselves? And we go on a word hunt. Where are we seeing these phonemes? Where are we seeing these phonemes in the books that we're reading? And that's why it's so important for us as teachers to, to choose those mentor texts that really lend themselves to what we're working on. And so again, if I'm working on the OI and the OY and that diphthong, am I finding a, a passage that has some of those that students can go and find? And once they do that, can they see, well, where does OI fit? Where does OY fit? Where are you seeing that pattern? And that's where a lot of times too and is, is where decodables come in um, because if it's pertained to a certain um, sound that then students would be easy to find that. Sometimes too, if we think, oh, go and pick a book anywhere in the classroom and try and find it. You know, sometimes too, having grade twos and threes, trying to scour through a graphic novel to find a certain phoneme might not be a, a good use of time. And so can I find something or put something in front of them that might have them there that they can find a bit quicker so that we can maximize that time together um, versus kind of that, you know, spray and pray approach with, with finding some of them. And again, as we go and learn more about some of the sounds, you might bring in some little games that might be quick and it might be a bingo and you're doing a sound or you're saying a word and do they understand, know what sound it is? And so again, just some things that once there's been that explicit instruction, what are some activities that you could do small group or as a class that just ties everything in together? As you do that, that's where morning messages may come in. If we're looking at punctuation, if we're looking at um, different phonics patterns, if we're coming up with different things. And so this is an example here um, that you can see. So are they talking about, you know, that, that magic E or that E bonker um, with that? Are they talking about a period? And now all of a sudden we've got to start it with some punctuation. So again, this just ties in all together that, that explicit stuff that, that you've been talking about in the phonics and phonemic awareness and in the writing all together in a morning message? Are you doing little activities that they need to, you know, sensory? Are they pushing a button into each one as they see a sound, but then they're also writing it too? So again, making that explicit connection. Not necessarily needed for all students, but is it there for some? As you move on to the phoneme and grapheme mapping. So I'm just giving them the boxes. And so as we learn words um, with the OI and the OY and that diphthong, my words that we're going to do, that dictation is going to be based on that. And so, you know, you think about spelling lists, spelling lists going home and you need to memorize these things. The way that I introduce this is this is the spelling pattern or this is the pattern we're working on in reading and writing. And so here are some of the words and here are some of the kind of the key ideas with it. But those words aren't going to be, um, you know, on the dictation on Friday. Um, you know, they're going to be different words. And so it's not that you need to memorize these. It's about understanding the pattern and understanding um, where it might come in the word and understanding the sound that it makes. But we've got activities throughout the week leading up to that, you know. And so it's just putting it again all together. And so you might have it in boxes as kids come up to the whiteboard. They, you know, obviously aren't going to draw boxes, but they might put little dashes. And so again, are they looking at some of these things as they hear it, as they understand how many um, phonemes, and then what's the graphing that matches that? And then always, there's, we continue to work on heart words. And so there's going to be some heart words that, that kids are going to, to look at every week. And there's not going to be new heart words every week. These heart words at the bottom here might be for three or four weeks. 
And so again, on the Friday, um, you know, or after two weeks or whenever it might be that I feel that the students are ready, we're going to check in and we're going to give 10, 10 words about that. We're going to look at some heart words, but then we also got to look previously. And so again, it can't be a one and done. It's got to continue to grow and spiral. And so what are some of the things that they would have done in weeks previous that then we can look at um, for this? And so again, we always look at decodables because of the great ones that we could use to find certain patterns um, in them that are already there. And then they start to be used for fluency. And so examples here, we know that, you know, the U-Fly has some great ones too. And, 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 and Raz, Raz Kids has some, and, and I've put them onto one pager so that we can quickly see them. But again, we can go through and hunt for some of these things. We can look at that. We, I get kids to highlight that. Where are you seeing these sounds? All right. And now we're starting to say, I'm going to model reading it. Let's read it together. You're going to read it to yourself. You're going to read it with somebody else. And so again, as I might take a small group, there's now other people that goes into their fluency duotang, where now I might say, go back and read, you know, fluency 12, uh, 14 and 16, read it to yourself, read it to somebody. It's not brand new. We've already spent a week dissecting this because we've looked at it through the lens of the phonics. We've looked at it through the lens of that decode and we've looked at it through the lens of that fluency piece. And now it's something that students can do we meanwhile, I might be also working on with a small group on some other targeted things. And so it's not fresh and new to them, but again, it's that practice opportunity. And so another one here, this is a picture as, as my, my nephew here is, you know, in, in grade one and he's looking at decodables and this is from whole phonics, um, you know, looking at Zach's cap, which is all about looking at the short A sound. And so again, that purpose for it, that if they, they can, they understand the consonants and now they're working on short vowels that decodable that they can sound these words out um, as they're reading this. And then again, that fluency. So that's what I said, you know, like I said before, those decodables and, and all that phonics verse that you've done comes into that fluency practice. And so again, you're modeling that and and you're helping students and you're assisting and, and you've got audio stuff. And, and I have, you know, fortunate that, you know, my, my mother does some voiceovers. And so she did the frog and toad in those voices. And, and, you know, students can have the book in front of them and listen to, to my mom read, um, you know, with that expression and, and, and with the different voices as they're reading alongside her. And so again, repeated reading and that those are some of those things we continue to go back to some of those fluency pieces when we look at what we've just dissected in the phonics or dissected and going through with the decoding. And we know for some, for some students, it's just they read it once and they're good and they discuss it and move on. And, and, and so again, where are our students at um, and, and what they need? And so again, we, we all know there's some activities that we can do introducing those poems and singing songs. I've talked about decodables. This is an example of a two voice passage. And so you're thinking about it on the left hand side there in the purple, I like to hop is one student on the other side is saying I like to skip and in the blue they say it together. So I like to hop, I like to skip, but sometimes when I hop I trip and sometimes when I skip I slip and then they both say it together. And so again that fluency where they're listening to somebody else and then they have to and then they have to come in and read it together. So just some activities with that obviously kids love jokes, the tongue twisters. Can they get into character? Okay, say this now mad, say this sad, say this as a robot, say this. And so again, can they understand the expression? But then does the expression change what you might be reading um, for that? And reader's theater and obviously progression reading. As you start to read, you might start small and then you slowly build up um, in that progression reading. And so again, just some fluency uh, activities. I'm going to quickly go through this because this was last week. And so, again, if you have more about this, but, um, you know, this is talking about that, that comprehension with that vocabulary knowledge. And again, I talked about it. Bringing Words to Life is a, is a great book um, for that. And so last week we talked about, you know, the, the three tiers um, and such. And I went through kind of teaching the vocabulary um, for that. And so, again, read that, read that story, that great picture book contextualize the word, um, have students say the word, provide that definition, that friendly definition, present some other examples, and then engage those students in activities and have children say the word back. 
And so there's, you know, identifying those words and, and like Andrea has her pre-service teachers do look for those two tier words that those ones that have that importance and utility that appear across a bunch of domains. The, the one that has that general concept, but provides that precision, you know, so instead of saying enough of something, it's sufficient. And that potential that has a variety of contexts, brush, am I brushing somebody? Is it brushing the hair? And so again, you really have to be purposeful in looking through the mentor texts and read alouds. And so I provided an example uh, of Dr. DeSoto and you could have picked delicate or dainty and could have gone through these things. And so again, they talk a bunch more about these activities. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through those today just for time. But again, are you gonna review it? Is there situations that you could give? Are you finding a missing word? And those types of things. And so again, I always start with vocabulary with the word collector, a, grit, a rich mentor text with that. And so the year may start out like this as empty and it continues to grow as we start to become word collectors. Uh, I also use the boy who love words as we're going to find words that you might find in, in different things um, and put them um, all together. And so the last one, again, ultimately looking at comprehension, comprehension instruction through those read alouds, through those mentor texts. I'm going to talk about the voices inside my head to the students as I'm reading a rich read aloud, you know. And so, again, as I'm reading me and Marvin Gardens to my grade two threes. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it's fantastic. Um, and so again, it's this, this animal that eats plastic and is it the pollution solution? Um, but the problem is, is that Marvin's scat um, is eating at the ground and is toxic. And so we're like, oh, the word scat is in this read aloud. This is a great opportunity to talk about that rich vocabulary. And so we did, so what does scat mean? And so then now, you know, as students are talking or they're talking about we're, we're going into nonfiction writing right now and looking at that, are they, in, are they using the word scat? Are they using some other ones that we have learned along the way? And so again, as they go out and read potentially independently, they're working on some goals. Are they working on how they might pay attention to making movies in their head or, or whether they're synthesizing or inferring? And that all starts with we modeling it. We're going to explicitly talk about it and they're going to go out and practice it. But again, largely, and I, and I was one when I first started, um, you know, teaching primary that I was spending month, a month on inferring, you know, and now it's, it's short because I've, I've got to spend some other time explicitly on other things. And so how can we still teach comprehension, but not in a large, large chunk? And Christopher mentions that as well um, in the book. And so that comprehension is that interaction between the reader and the text. And so can we understand the structure and the words and the syntax and the context? And I, I, I was just talking about it with my class where we're going through nonfiction. And one of the things we talked about, just like Andrea mentioned, a lot of my students don't read the heading. And so when we talked about it in the writer's lens, we talked about why is a heading important? Well, yeah, because that gets our mind ready for what we're reading. And that's why headings are there. And so now looking at that through that writing piece, it's clicking for some students that now when I read them, they read nonfiction to me, they're not missing the heading anymore. And so again, just including that writing component as we talk about different text structures and words, you know, as they're becoming writers, they have to be more mindful, which then transfers into, into their reading. And so we listen to all of these voices in our head. So as teachers, we have to model and explain and apply these things. Um, in our read alouds and in our mentor text for a short snippet of time and not like I did in years past, spent too much time on these things and not enough on some of the other. And so this is kind of, again, in that structure of, of putting it all together and hopefully you can see where you might piece this and put this in um, into your day, into your literacy block of tying all these pieces um, together. And so this is, I know there's many ways to do it, but this is just a brief example of how I wove all of these in together. And so we will at this time um, break into some breakout rooms and hear some great things um, from others that are, that are in the room here. And so as uh, before we go into these rooms, here are some of the things that uh, we need to keep in mind. You know, what are some at home reading um, do you use or do you have your students use or that you like uh, for that? 
How are you putting pillars into practice? How are you putting it all together? What are some of the things you're doing? What does your block look like? And, and again, one of the things too is Christopher has been um, so generous that any questions we have, any questions we have, um, Christopher will answer. And so one of the things we need to do is as you talk, if there's things that you have questions about that you wanna hear him say, or you want him to answer, um, when we come back, Andrea is gonna, gonna um, jot the questions down and we'll forward them on to, to Christopher and then he'll, uh, he'll give us a little video reply of the questions that we ask him. And so as we break in, think about at-home reading, how are we putting this in all together? There's lots of ways to do it. How do you interweave everything um, into, your, into your literacy block? And then again, what questions do you have that you know, Christopher can answer? Um, for us. And so I'll stop sharing here and pass it over to Andrea, who will start putting us into to breakout rooms. Yeah, Alicia will do that for us. Okay. Alicia got to uh, me. All right, I think that's everyone. So welcome back. What I would really appreciate if you did come up with um, a couple questions for Chris, if you if somebody from your group wants to pop them in the chat, then I know Alicia will uh, be able to get those um, off the chat. And if you you know maybe have a question you didn't you didn't want to share with your group, but you would really like maybe a response to, um, you can email it to to either of us, and we'd be happy to submit that to him as well. So. I would, I'm really excited for this. Um, I'm, I'm going to invite Stacy to come on. And um, I know that she has some colleagues, I think, who are here as well, who might want to jump in. If not, that's okay. But Stacy um, has been doing some exceptional work in her school division to think about how they can um, uh, use assessments. And so I want to let her speak to that um, because We've done wide scale change in Saskatoon Public uh, around which assessments we're using to monitor reading uh, progress. We're using the Acadians measures. We're using the um, actually the whole suite of measures from Acadians, but um, you you don't have to do it division wide. And so I want her to speak to how she's been been approaching that with some of the her colleagues in her school division. So welcome, Stacy. It's so nice to see you again. It's nice to see you, and I'm humbled that. I, that I get to talk. I said to Chad, I could just sit and listen to both of you just talk and talk, and I I love it. So, um, just a little bit of background knowledge, uh, background information about me. Um, I am in Moose Jaw. We are in Holy Trinity Catholic School Division, and I had the pleasure of meeting Andrea a year ago, um, taking one of her classes, and it was fantastic, and it was really really good, and I learned so much. Um, I have to say, I was. Kind of steeped in the the balanced literacy world, I I grew up in that you know twenty five years in that in that world. Um, I had the chance to see Fontes and Pinnell speak at ILA, and I literally had a front row seat. <laughs> I was like right there, and so you know it's been a it's been a slow burn, and and it's been a learning process for me, and just understanding that my my kids weren't getting there um, with what I was doing, and I was teaching with fidelity I felt like I was teaching with fidelity and they still weren't getting there and I needed to do more and more and more and so you know just started researching on my own and you know just reading and watching everything that I could um and then I took Andrea's class and we were talking about assessment and that was kind of the, the last straw for me is that assessment because I was really skeptical Andrea at the very beginning when you're talking about an alternate assessment and for me you know being in a learning facilitator at Holy Trinity um, growing up in the literacy world I was an LLI coach um, I was just in that world and so when you start talking about you know assessment and Fontes and Pinnell assessment that was really striking at something that was that was at the core of me and and so I I was I listened to you and I I started just experimenting with it um, about a year ago and just playing around with it at first with the kids. Um, and I really started to, you know, have this aha moment. And it was just, it was one of those things that has continued to grow. Um, and I think for me, the biggest thing was 
looking at assessment and, and truly looking at what is assessment and why do we do this? Um, you know, and so we talk about, you know, rather than being a hammer, it's got to be that flashlight. And I think for many of us, it's it's been that hammer in Holy Trinity, we have to assess three times a year, grade one to five since COVID, it's been what grades one to five, um, three times a year. And that's a lot of time that's spent on these assessments. Um, and so, and if you talk to the teachers, they're not getting the data and the information that they need out of these assessments. They're only doing it because they're being asked to do it. Um, and so they are getting the data from other assessments, but we're still asked to do that, that Fontes and Pinnell. Um, you know, and we talk about, you know, it being, it should be that flashlight and it should inform and drive instruction. And other than getting the level, it really wasn't giving us a lot of information, even if we analyze the MSV, um, it still wasn't getting us, you know, what are the specific skills that that child needs to get to the next level. And so it, it wasn't, it wasn't doing that. So just experimenting it with it last year, um, talking to my superintendents, he gave us the grace to only take in the, the last two reporting periods for FNP. So it allowed us to experiment with um, that first reporting period. And I was saying to, um, in the small group, we did the PLC shifting the balance this year. And so we had a lot of teachers in our school division who are looking for something else too. Um, and they're looking at ways that they can shift what they're doing in their classroom, which is great, but just doing it more thoughtfully, more intentionally, doing things that are more aligned with what the children need. So we've been doing this PLC, the Shifting the Balance PLC throughout the year, and we've had just so much excitement. I've never seen so much excitement about literacy and teaching, and it's been really fun to see. And so this giving us that, that first reporting period allowed us that time to get some of these teachers who are curious about assessment, about um, alternate assessments. And, and because we're a, a small school division, it allowed me to sit side by side with these teachers and do these assessments and really talk about, you know, what we're doing. And, and it was really fascinating to see. Um, they still have to submit the mid and end of year F and P, but a lot of them are continuing on um, because they're still finding that the Acadians is giving them the information that they need. So it's been really interesting. So we said, you know, for assessment to be, you know, worthwhile, it's got to be reliable and valid and it's got to be predictive and it's got to be efficient. And I think the biggest thing for me is that time. And it's just, it's so frustrating right now to see you know, in these COVID days when we talk about closing gaps and we talk about, you know, reducing that that post-COVID bulge, that tier two bulge. And, you know, we talk about the immense amount of time that we're spending on these assessments. It's, it's, um, it's hard to justify. And so we've been, our teachers have been using this assessment um, throughout the year. Um, when we talk about the, the reliability and the ability that's one thing that we noticed as well. There's there were certain classrooms that, um, you know, the, the kids would be at a certain level one year, and then the next year they they would change quite significantly. Um, and so, from school to school or teacher to teacher, there was that variance in the text complex text complexities and the the F and P. It was different as well. I don't know if you some of your teachers you know, we'll choose a certain book over the other because they just know that the child is gonna do so much better. Like it's just not a valid measure. And so um, that kind of leveled the playing field too, just going, switching to the Acadians. Um, it just, it took away that, that, that variability. Um, and it, even just the, the time, like we said, um, you know, for the upper grades, we're benchmarking grade fives and those books take so much time. And then if you don't get it right the first time, you have to go up or down. It just took so much so much time and our teachers really appreciated. They did those, those quick assessments and then they were able to figure out what they needed. You know, and, and Andrea, you talked about that, their, you know, thermometer test or that temperature check. 
eat right and we just want to know like do they have a fever we want to make sure that we're identifying the students that are at, at need in need and then you know do they have a fever or do they not and if they have a fever then you can go ahead and take a deeper dive and do those diagnostics and that allows us to really focus on the children that we that we really need to and I was talking to our superintendent just this week and talking about this and um and he says oh so this is like you know screening everybody for cancer with a CT or an MRI you know and I said yeah like that's kind of the idea like we're taking something that's you know taking a lot of time a lot of valuable time and 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 using it on these on all of our, our kids um so it's been really interesting to see just how the teachers have been using it, um, how they've often said that this better aligns with their instructional practices. They, you know, because they're they're moving, um, being more intentional in those pillars, and and they're saying this aligns a little bit better. Um, I just did an Excel sheet for the teachers, and we were able to just um, graph the data. And for me, it was you know such a visual thing. And so we were able to compare the marks and talking about fluency does comprehension. And um, it's just been really interesting to see the accuracy, how the accuracy changes um, about, you know, the diagnostics that he uses using the spelling inventory. And so we've been able to do the Acadians and then really talk about next steps and purposeful next steps and you know digging into a little bit deeper doing the spelling inventory figuring out what they need um, we've been doing paragraph shrinking with some classes um, just to give them those those reps and work on fluency and and that comprehension piece we've been working on morphology we've been we've just been really able to change some of our instructional practices that that will address the the Acadians. So it's been really interesting. Like we've been, you know, like I said, some of the teachers, whether, you know, whether whatever happens next year with, with the province and the ministry, they'll still do it because they're getting the data that they need and the information that they need. So it's been really interesting. Um, like I said, I, we just had, had some, some really keen teachers asked to use it this year. Um, next year, um, the same thing's gonna be true. I was talking to our superintendent and he said, um, we're gonna give our teachers a choice next year. Um, the reporting at the end of the year is the sticky part. The ministry is still asking for that, that FNP, um, which is a little bit, <laughs> doesn't, um, doesn't quite make sense, um, but because we've got the above, at, and below, um, but that's going to come. So I think we're we're going to be able to offer it to more people, and it's been word of mouth. Um, the more people that I sit side by side and work on the Acadians, they've been telling a friend, and then they tell a friend, and it's just it's quick and easy. Um, like I said, I was a little bit skeptical too. I felt like I you know, I liked the levels and I was talking to a teacher um, and she was, she's a fantastic teacher. And she says, I think we need to keep the FNP. And I said, well, why, why is that? Why do you feel that way? And she said, our parents like the levels. I like knowing what the levels are. Um, and I said, too, like, it's going to take some education. It's going to take some, some teaching of the teachers and the parents, you know, what to expect. I think we've trained parents to know that FNP levels although it doesn't really tell you exactly what skills they have. Um, but I, you know, I said, so other than knowing the levels, I said, you know, what has it given you? And, and she couldn't really tell me. And, and, uh, and she said, if she's worth her, her salt, she could tell you exactly who's at or at above or below. And I said, so, so where's your time better used? You know, she's a an amazing teacher. And isn't her time better spent sitting face to face, side by side with these little ones addressing their needs than doing these these really timely assessments? And she's like, "Yeah, you're right." <laughs> so, so we've been we've been kind of shifting it and just 
really be being thoughtful and purposeful and you know where is our time better spent and like I said it's the time for me it's just we need to get in and you know get in and get out and figure out who needs help and and then we can do that deeper dive but yeah it's it's been a, a really big shift this year but a good one Stacey, do you just want to let people know in case they aren't at all familiar with any of like the Acadians, just what that administration process looks like? And when you talk about the, the time efficiency, um, you know, what does that look like, say, compared to an FMP? Um, I just worked with a grade five, six teacher today. And, and so it's, you know, at, correct me if I'm wrong, but grade three, grade three and up, it's that oral reading fluency. And so it's three one minute readings and so you just the you set the timer um and the child reads for one minute and you you mark any of their errors um you know you just slash them um and then you do a quick comprehension check and it's just can they can they retell the information can they can they give you a proper retell um they're not telling you you know, making connections like, oh, you know, I used to make pickles with my grandma years ago. It's just strictly can they retell from the text? And so you just score that. You do it three times and you take the, the median score so that you have a more reliable score. And then there's a maze assessment, which is kind of a closed procedure. Um, it gives you a little booklet and then you read the sentences and you choose one of the three words. And so it'll say we ran blank after school and they have to pick the, the right word. And, you know, it kind of shows, are they choosing? Sometimes there's an adjective or a noun or a verb. And so it's that syntax, like, are they understanding? Are they reading for meaning? And so it looks like it would be very easy, but it's so interesting how the kids find that really difficult and it's really telling and so it, it's that flashlight like oh my gosh okay so we need to do a little bit of work um with the littles they have um the the segmentation so are they able to segment words properly um it has the nonsense word um assessment so there's a number of different things for the littles for grade one and two and i believe at grade two they start with the oral reading fluency it starts with that, or no, even grade one starts with oral reading fluency. So it's been really interesting. And our grade one and two teachers said, like, this is what they're teaching. Like they're, they're, this aligns with their instruction. And so it's been really interesting. And, and like I said, it's that flashlight. I've sat down side by side with so many teachers and they've been like, I know what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm like, that's what assessment should be, <laughs> right? Like, you know, so it should inform that, that next day's instruction. It should, you know, you can make those small groups now knowing what they're doing and what they need. And so that's been the, the really exciting part for me too, that, you know, I get to see this really great instruction. What they were doing was amazing. What they're doing now is even better. So it's that time for me, it's the time that, you know, our, our kids are losing out um, doing these really lengthy assessments. Our teachers are getting stressed out, um, having to use their preps and all these different things, you know, and so this is just, it's a better use of our time. Um, and so, yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm hoping that the ministry kind of aligns with, <laughs> I think, I think it's coming. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's, it's great because, um, you know, not only you and the work that you're doing there and, and working alongside teachers to, to, you know, start implementing those assessments. Um, and I know other school divisions, I'm not sure if any of you, um, have been doing some of these, um, the, you know, it's a cadence or dibbles or Ames web. They're, they're all, you know, similar, just, you know, different companies. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I think that the ministry hears that that school divisions want change, um, and and so you know, I think the ball is rolling. And as we all know, even in schools, change can take a long time. 
Um, but I was so excited to hear that you were able to like, not only with the support of your superintendent, because I think sometimes we just do it with the door closed because we don't have the support of, <laughs> you know, an administrator or superintendent, which is, is fine too. But, um, you know, it always feels better when we have some of that support. So I'm really excited to continue to hear how you guys are doing with that. Um, so thanks so much for sharing that work. Um, I think it's really important to hear sort of that, that grassroots um, story about, you know, it's not everybody and it doesn't have to be everyone. And so for those of you that are joining us, um, if you have an expectation that you're, you have to submit FMP or, you know, PM benchmarks or DRAs or whatever that happens to be, um, you know, I think, you know, it's, that's fair and it's fine. Um, but if you are really wanting, like Stacy said, to implement um, an assessment practice that is more reliable and valid um, and that will guide your instruction. You know, Acadians is available for free online. Um, so that's important to know. You don't actually have to pay. It's all free to download um, for the grade level. So, um, so you can, you can look at that or, you know, I'm happy um, you We've, we've been doing it with Saskatoon Public. I'm happy to answer any questions any of you might have. You can send me an email. So I don't want to take any more time. I do want to say thank you on behalf of Chad and I. I want to thank Stacy. I want to thank all of our past guest presenters. I am hugely thankful to Alicia for all of the work that she's done and her team at Dyslexia Canada. This was truly enjoyable for me. And um, and I'm so glad we all got to connect. I do, um, I would love to continue to do a book study. So thinking about, you know, maybe another book um, next year that, that we might be interested in and would love for you guys to join us. So um, I'm hoping this isn't the last one. Yes, Brooke, I will, I will do that. Alicia, do you have any last words for us? My only last word is to really say thank you to you and Chad for putting this together and for all of the time that you put in. You guys had really wonderful presentations and uh, I learned a lot uh, from the ones that I sat in for. And so thank you both. And thank you everybody for joining. You bet, thank you so much. Just don't close the chat yet before I can put it in and you can send it out. <laughs>